So welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our November AD meeting. We're excited to meet with you again this month and um, have our virtual only option today because we didn't have access at USBE, um, the rooms available for everyone. So we're virtual only today, but welcome and we'll be monitoring the chat. We don't have a Nearpod session um, today, so we'll just be uh, communicating through the chat or coming off of um, mute if you have questions that you want to ask the whole group. Um, but we're excited to have everybody today and thanks again for joining us. We'll jump in with our slides. This month being um, Thanksgiving and thinking about gratitude, the quote that I wanted to start off this, this meeting with was from Randy Pausch, who's the author or the, the um, professor from Carnegie Mellon that um, wrote the book and gave the lecture, the last lecture, and he was um, dying of cancer and decided that he wanted to give his last lecture and had some of um, his thoughts on life that he shared in that book and that um, actual lecture. But one of the quotes that I really appreciated from that book is that showing gratitude is one of the simplest yet most powerful things humans can do for each other. And <clears throat> I wanted to say thank you, first of all, to you all for being here but especially to my team, I'm sorry, <laughs> my team, we've had a lot going on in our office and and me personally with uh, my death and the family and things, but our team at USB has been so gracious and stepped up for those um, on our team that are dealing with some things. And I'm sorry, you guys, I thought I had it pulled together, but I apologize. Um, but just really want to say thank you to our assessment team um, for their willingness to jump in and to help with anything that they needed to and to um, really just jump in and, and provide any kind of assistance that they could. So thank you so much for my team and for you all assessment directors for being understanding in some of the delayed in responses and anything like that, but thank you. Okay. I didn't realize I was going to get emotional about that, but thank you so much. So the next thing on our slide deck is some updates from our last board meeting. So at the board meeting last week, we had one um, update from USPE from the assessment department, and we had a contract amendment with Pearson that was approved um, to move forward with some additional reading item development. So we had some um, funding that we're going towards some specific item development in reading that's aligned to some of our new standards where we had a few gaps. We have we have items to assess, um, but we have not as full of a bank as we want in certain areas. So we got approved for some additional um, development for reading um, with our Pearson contract for ninth and 10th grade. So we'll move forward with that. Coming up in future board meetings, um, we have a couple of board rules that need some adjustments. So on the next slide, we have um, the future board rules that we're looking at adjusting. Um, one board rule includes English for UA plus and also has um, some kindergarten changes with KEEP. So 404, we're gonna be changing that in coming board meetings. Um, 726.7 has to do with some rostering. That will be in our December board meeting. And really specifically just the language that's around SOEP schools. And there's one um, clause in that section, in that rule that talks about um, the, the provider of the SOEP will be the one to administer the assessments instead of the provider working with the local LEA um, to help the students. Uh, to administer the assessments at the local LEA. So we have to change just a court that instead of saying the provider will proctor or administer the assessment, we're just changing that the provider will coordinate with um, the LEA to proctor or provide those assessments. And then um, 497 is an accountability rule and we it still includes the grading, the grading for school accountability. And so that's something that we'll be adjusting in future board meetings as well. We have a couple of procurements for some of our big contracts that we work on, um, the English language proficiency assessment with WIDA. We're hoping to do a sole source contract with that and we're moving forward our contract with them in at the end of this year, so in, the, in June. So we're hoping to move forward with um, moving forward with a sole source contract with WIDA, um, and we'll keep you posted as we know more about that. And we're also intending with our alternate assessment, which is DLM, we have optional five years of additional contracts, so we're pursuing that contract ex extension with that DLM um, contract. And I think 
that was it of, of my update slides. If you have any questions, let us know, and then I think we'll move on to WIDA. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, pausing on our intro screen really quick, I'm gonna start dropping all the hints of remember to bubble correctly, because um, not bubbling correctly as we enter access testing could be a costly mistake. So as assessment directors, and um, this, has, this is being messaged out to ALS directors as well, please just remember, especially when it comes to the kindergarten access um, or any at paper forms that require bubbling, please, please, please make sure that test administrators know to bubble correctly. Check marks or dashes do not work and not be, um, they will not be uh, scored correctly and you would have to put in a rescore request, which um, I, if, I haven't looked at this year's pricing, but I feel like it's uh, about 200 or about 200 per test to be rescored. So these, these are not good mistakes um, to make. So please make sure that um, you are um, aggressively, but nicely, um, what is our saying? Firm, but... Firm, but friendly. friendly. Thank you, Elise. Firm, but friendly reminders. About, yes, firm, but friendly reminders that we need to do proper bubbling. I know it feels like the 80s and 90s with a Scantron, but we gotta lean into those, you know, those skills. All right, so you'll just see my random reminders and in, in pictures. So hopefully um, the graphic will stick in people's minds. All right, so um, moving on. Um, you probably saw this in the memo. We are still getting questions about the alternate access exit on a weekly basis. Um, so the, the more you can help um, messaging out this to your schools and your, um, your, your colleagues, we have messaged this out a ton with um, different curriculum specialists, ALS directors, but for some reason we are still getting this nonstop. So as we know, alternate access was revised. Um, we do not have an alternate exit criteria still. We we are in the process of establishing that right now, but until that time of it being established and approved, um, we cannot exit those students. So um, please help us again in that messaging. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, and then as we um, announced last time, we do have the alternate PLDs. This can help inform instruction. And also the alternate can-do descriptors came out. Um, um, in our previous meeting and they are available online. So these slides do have um, the links directly to those resources. Moving on. Thank you, ma'am. All right, so looking ahead, um, just so you all, all are aware, um, the first pre-ID file was submitted to DRC. Um, please remember though that you will not see those students in AMS until the test setup window starts. The test setup window does not start until December 4th, but as soon as that window opens on the 4th, you will be able to see all the students that were in um, that initial pre-ID upload. Please also remember that all materials were ordered based on that first pre-ID upload. And those materials include kindergarten access and all access online. So remember that we do have paper writing in the lower grades, so that is included, okay? Um, the only thing that LEAs were responsible for ordering um, in our initial ordering window was Braille and alternate or large print, um, you know, or if you have students that do have to take full paper. Um, it's always good to remember that you cannot do a hybrid. You can't do um, in the upper grades some paper, some online. The only time there is any kind of hybrid, which is that writing on paper, is for those lower grades, but that is still considered online. If a student does need paper, the entire thing has to be on paper, so you can't do any hybrid past that. 
So um, again, if you missed any um, any of those ordering windows, please note that the the additional materials ordering window opens when testing opens. So you can place any orders. But do be aware that um, we always send a little extra and overage in your shipments. So just remember that the shipments as they come, um, it is on a Friday and a Monday. UPS will not deliver on the weekend, so don't worry about being on location to receive those. Um, the second pre-ID file will be submitted on the 11th of December. So any new ELs to your LEA um, will either be transferred or added um, to AMS for you. After the 11th, any students that you do get that are identified as EL, um, they, they will need to be manually added by you, your LEA, okay? Um, if you have any questions, please reach out. Um, happy to help. As you know, you will be getting instructions for every step of the way from DRC um, with screenshots and everything for all the different processes as we go. All right. And then just our, our overview calendar of where we're at. Um, so I've bolded what's coming up next, okay? And again, you will be getting updates from myself in the AD memos and also from DRC. Okay. Um, again, if you have any questions, just let us know. And next. Definitely not reading the super wordy slide, but these are upcoming free access webinars um, in the during the next month. Oh, that first one, that already happened, but it is on there just as a reminder to um, that if you ever miss these, these are always recorded and you can go and find them and watch them later. Um, so you would need to go to your, um, to either your WIDA Secure Portal or your AMS account. It just depends on the different webinar. So there is one today in a little while um, and then alternate a uh, webinar is coming up. We also just had a training specific to Utah Access um, this week, and that will be posted to um, the WIDA Secure Portal as well, um, probably by next Tuesday, I want to say. So if you couldn't make it, um, the recording will be available, and that's specific to Utah. And then next um, these were the trainings. Again, this was um, a reminder that the access webinar specific to Utah took place. Again, the recording will be posted next week. And then there are two more um, USBE and WIDA hosted webinar trainings coming up through the rest of the year. One is going to be in the winter and then the next one will actually be in the summer. So if you have any questions, um, please reach out and I can give you more information. Um, the descriptions of these trainings are posted in Midas where you can register for those. And then finally, um, there was a question last uh, time in our AD meeting about the seal of biliteracy. Um, and so the seal of biliteracy had as one of the um, acceptable assessments for evidence, Utah Spire Plus English subtest, but because that was retired, that is no longer um, an option for the seal of biliteracy. And at this time, there is not a test that can replace it. So unfortunately, that has been removed from the seal of biliteracy assessment um, evidence. And then there were other questions about access on the assessment chart for the seal of biliteracy. And um, Carl and I had some meetings and we updated that portion of the assessment chart for the seal of biliteracy to include the speaking component. Um, since it only had the overall 4.2 for proficiency, it now has the overall 4.2 with the speaking of 3.5 to show proficiency. And again, that should be um, that should be reflected on now the assessment chart. I do believe it has been updated on the website, but sometimes it just takes some time. Um, is it being reviewed to include any grade on WIDA? I believe that yes, 
that was um, the discussion that Carl um, had with a couple of LEAs to say, um, yes, because you can show him proficiency at any level, I believe he said, would be acceptable. Um, that is definitely a question, though, for Carl, as um, he 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 oversees the seal of biliteracy. I'm the messenger. Um, you are welcome to email me, and I can help get you in contact with him to help um, clarify any questions or misunderstandings or where clarification is needed. But I've also included Carl's uh, email address on this slide. And then finally, again, dropping my hints, bubble, not check mark. Um, you can contact us anytime. Email is probably the most efficient and quickest way um, to get in touch with myself or Tracy. And then I'm also just putting um, reminders of our websites on um, our, our slides. Um, a lot of questions that we've been getting can be answered from our websites, um, especially our USB EWIDA assessment we website. Um, and if you go down to the assessment guidance PDF that's located on that website, um, that answers so many questions that we get on a daily basis. Um, so, so do know that um, resources are out there to support you if you can't get in touch with us immediately. But I believe that is it for me. Thanks so much. Trying to find my find my mute button. Go ahead. Um, just a reminder of our middle of year dates. They're coming up um, for starting. So please make sure you have a plan in place for that middle of the year benchmarking. Next. Um, I get a lot of emails about that data is not transferring between students. We are we know this, it is currently not transferring when they change LEAs. So please be aware of that, share that with your administrators um, and your coaches. And then please, please, as students are transferring during that middle of the year benchmarking, um, make sure they have not taken the benchmark measure before you administer it. So we don't want to be giving the benchmarking twice during that middle of the year time period. Um, you can request their middle of year data from their previous school. However, here's the issue. If the student is no longer enrolled at the school, they have been dropped from their roster. And unless they've printed out their data, they don't actually have access to the data anymore unless they go through a manually enrollment process and then the student will appear in their rosters again with their data, but that's a lot to ask a previous school. So I can see um, in the chat, schools deny sharing the info. I, It's most likely they don't have a printout of the info and the student's no longer in their system. Um, you can request original benchmarking reports from parents if they have them from the beginning of the year and I just spoke with Acadians. I believe they are planning on having student data transferring in January. It might be a little sooner than that, but not likely. So that is the date that I was, or the month I was given. Um, they're meeting today, actually, and I'm going to get some additional information um, when they um, finalize that release for student data transferring with the student. Um, but the plan right now is sometime January. Um, yeah, so if they, if the student has moved at all, that data is going to be missing for them if they have changed LEAs. So as of January, that shouldn't be an issue, and the information is going to transfer with the students, and I know that it's a struggle. So I'm super sorry, <laughs> but there's nothing that I can actually do about it right now, other than we've been pushing for that to happen um, so that that data can transfer. 
So if the student has already been given that benchmark measure, they transfer, you don't have any information on that student, please give a progress monitoring. Um, I'm not sure if the January change will help with students with merged SSID numbers. We are going to be working internally for that concern um, so that we can let that information go to the LEA and make sure that um, that merged ID that that student gets out there. So if you, so there's a couple people saying we're just going to print out that report and include it in their CUME file. That would be wonderful for those of you who are giving, for students that transfer, we know this happens a lot as students transfer between um, different LEAs in our state and everybody wants students to be successful and not having that literacy data definitely makes it hard to provide interventions and appropriate instruction for that student. So um, the info transfer will not be retroactive. Well, I. I think it will just be moving forward. Um, I don't think they'll be able to pull in data from previously, but that's a great question that I will ask them. That was not something that we had discussed. So yes, you can definitely print that raw data for the beginning of the year, put it in the student's file so that they, if they do transfer, they have that or make it part of the process that if the student is transferring, you print off that student's um, data before they get removed from your system. Once they're out of your SIS system, you don't have access to that and the data won't transfer to their new LEA either. Um, yeah, so Stacy says, when we find out a student's transferring, we print out the reports and include them. Um, and yes, I know that's an extra step, but it is in the best interest of students if it's possible to do that. So, um, Again, especially if the student, as we start in that MOI period, please um, be willing to share that information as much as possible. Um, you should be able to progress monitor. You just have to enroll them in the system. I will double check with that, but you, shouldn't give another beginning of the year benchmark. The, the ALO system allows that to happen. Um, however, that benchmark data is not valid in the fact that gave it in November when our window closes, um, you know, the end of September, um, and can definitely impact their growth and a whole lot of other things. So uh, my understanding is you can enroll the student in progress monitoring, even if you don't have a beginning of the year benchmark. And what you can do is do a one-time progress monitoring and then get a baseline for the student and determine um, what interventions they need and what level they should be for progress monitoring. And you might have to do a couple um, if they're going to be off grade. Um, so Cindy, your testing window in ALO is four weeks long. It requires you to set it up. You can go past that as long as you're still within the state window. So if you have schools that want to do it during different times, set it your window to start with the first school that wants to start their um, benchmarking. And then you can go as long as the state window is and pass the four week ALO window that's set up for your specific LEA. Brittany, I'm going to double check on that because that was not my understanding that the benchmark has to be administered before you can do progress monitoring. So I will double check on that. It's supposed to be in January. I don't have an exact date yet. They were meeting, Acadians was meeting today to discuss the exact date releases. So I will, when I have that information, I ask them to share it with me. I will send it out in an AD memo and then of course include it in AD meeting um, next month. So sometime January, I just don't have it yet. Okay, um, next slide. And then benchmark 
progress monitoring selection. So you can administer a benchmark outside of the state or LEA window in the Acadians assessment. If a benchmark is given outside of the benchmark window, um, please invalidate that because we, we don't want that data to be part of the student's score. But if a benchmark is accidentally given during the benchmark window, then it stays as the student's benchmark score and you cannot invalidate it. So if it uh, to do a progress monitoring probe, but it's in the middle of the year benchmark window and they don't and it's December and they don't normally do benchmarking until January, that score stays because that is part of our testing ethics is that we are administering the correct assessments during the time they're supposed to be administered. So please share that down to everybody that's administering assessments that you can't invalidate that benchmark if it's given during the benchmark window. So I have had a few LEAs reach out um, that benchmarks were accidentally given outside of the benchmark window. So like in October and November, and I asked them to invalidate that, but we're starting not like we don't have very long before that middle of the year benchmark window opens. So if benchmarks are given, they, they stay as the student's benchmark score. And I think that's all I had. Yep. All right, just a few things for Apple as the window is winding down. Uh, next slide. First, when it comes to your retest requests, just a reminder that we minimize these as much as possible, okay? There is a possibility that Carl or I will grant you the option to order a second test for a student if the student had consistent technical difficulties, um, if there's extenuating circumstances outside the uh, student's control. For example, we had a fire alarm occur, so things like that. They are not going to be issued, though, for students who we don't feel did their best or neglected to respond in the target language, if they weren't speaking clearly, if there's a lot of background noise, because that really comes down to your proctoring and ensuring that the test is being administered in the most appropriate situation for the student to be successful. So just be aware of that. Um, the next thing I want to point out with Apple Test, go ahead and go to the next slide, is you are getting down to the end of the availability for a rating review. Um, if you expect the student to have the opportunity to test again. With your rating reviews, just as a reminder that you are only issued the option to submit rating reviews for 10% of the orders that you have um, already acquired for your school, okay? They're also only for the human rated components. They need to still take place in the window. So the later you test, the less time you have, there's 10 days. Friends, there's exact, there's like basically 10 days until the window closes. So <laughs> this is the end for your rating reviews if you're expecting the student to have an opportunity to possibly be issued a second test. Other rating reviews submitted after today, we like we really can't even guarantee it because there's not 10 days. Okay. Uh, next slide. Just as a reminder, if you are not sure how to check for which schools are possibly behind with their Apple testing, when you log into your client site, you can scroll to the very bottom and there is a graph. And if you change the type drop down to read below N1, your schools are going to populate with a lovely little bar graph like this and you can see their completion rate, okay? So you can start reaching out to them if they need some help completing that in the next week and a half. All right, another really nice um, feature that's there on that same graph is if you sort by mode, go ahead and go to the next slide, it will look like this. And so you'll see which tests have been completed total for your LEA, which ones have ratings still out pending, and then which ones are still scheduled, okay, so that you can check those. As a reminder, the window closes November 29th, and I'm putting a little caveat here on the slide. Are you even in school that day? Because odds are you're not. It's the Friday after Thanksgiving. So if your students are not in school that Friday, you cannot plan to test them. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it's pretty safe to say you're not in school on the 28th either. And for many of you, you might not be in school on the 27th. So be thinking now, this is really your last, next week is your last full week 
with students in your building to complete your Apple test. Okay, so put it on your calendar. I want it on your radar because every year the holidays somehow throw someone for a loop and they weren't planning appropriately. When it comes to RISE testing, go ahead and go to the next slide. One after even is fine. Um, CAI communicated with us this week that the iPad OS and Mac OS update has now been um, implemented so they can support iPad OS 18 as well as Mac OS 15 for RISE test administration. Okay. And if you need any help or have questions with that, you can contact the RISE help desk and they can walk you through if you need any extra support um, with getting your secure browsers set up to um, with these with these systems if you haven't already. Something else I'd like to share with you today is a tight enhancement that was um, updated this week. There is now a favorites option so that you can save advanced search options under plan and manage testing. So if you have a set way that you have been selecting that, you can now save that option and be able to reuse it in future um, anytime you log in. So uh, go to the next slide. There's also the added option to select all within rosters with associated schools. So this is just going to improve test ticket sorting. You can now print test tickets from roster lists and they'll be organized first by roster, then grade, and then alphabetical. Okay, so just be aware of these couple of enhancements. Also, CEI is working to add these to the new Tide user guide, and there will be the messaging that goes out when all of that has been updated as well, so that it's also included in the documentation so that you have it to be um, updated there. Um, as a reminder, the mid-year summative window has opened. Go ahead and go to the next slide. It will close during um, the holiday break, so between December 20th and January 2nd. It is not available, or January 1st, I apologize, um, but then opens again on January 2nd and will be available through the end of February. Any test that has been started prior to February 28th will need to be done and submitted if uh, you have students doing a, a mid-year summative, okay? As a reminder, this is for any courses where instruction is ending sometime within that mid-year summative window. So if you have courses that end in December, that test needs to be completed by the end of December as well. During the mid-year summative window, benchmark tests are still available, okay? And also, as a point of clarification, your summative test windows can now be entered for math and science summative tests. They cannot currently be entered for ELA because those ones are not currently available for the summative window, okay? Those ones will uh, come later. For Utah Aspire Plus, um, just as a heads up for you, the Adam system will load your new and current student information in January for the spring 2025 administration. Remote administration is going to be available for online instruction students only. And remember that this um, little caveat here is, is enrolled in one course, the test will need to be administered in person. So for example, if a student does all online with the exception of driver's ed and goes to their local brick and mortar school for driver's ed, the student will still be expected to test in person at that brick and mortar school. There were trainings announced for both the technology training as well as our test administration training in the October AD meeting. So if you missed that, you'll wanna go back and rewatch it. I've also included it in a couple of the October AD memos. Um, and I will also add them uh, once a month until we get to that point, but I don't want to over overemphasize it <laughs> and have you miss it because it's already been in there so many times. So if you missed it, that's where you can find it and continue to watch for more updates. And I think that's all I have. Yep, and so um, just touching on the updates to RISE and Utah Aspire Plus for language arts, um, we did do our training last week. We had a very large crowd. It was fantastic. Um, but please, please reach out if you have any questions. We just wanted to review a couple more items since um, there, there were some questions where um, in confusion. And so we wanted to provide a little more clarity and opportunities for questions and trainings. So with that, um, one thing that definitely um, 
we realized coming out of the trainings and the various meetings that we've been having is that there um, is definitely some confusion around the different assessment types available through RISE. Um, and so uh, I think a, a lot of us are familiar with this, but if you're new, this, this might not be very familiar. And so really understanding the distinction between um, the different assessments available through RISE. There are benchmarks, there are interims, and there are summative assessments. Benchmarks are short tests, okay? And again, from the state, they are optional, okay? Um, they are for all grades um, that are assessed in RISE, so that's grades three through eight. Um, and really, truly now, um, they are just reading benchmarks, and writing benchmarks, okay? Um, so that's what's available. There are no longer the language benchmarks, um, the editing task ones, or the speaking and listening ones due to the, the shift in the standards. Interims, and this is one where we saw the most confusion. Interims are optional from the state. Um, again, they are available for all RISE assessed grades three through eight. They are only available for reading, essentially, ELA, just the reading standards. So those interims are going to, to reflect the new updated blueprints, okay? Um, so there will be no language items, no speaking and listening items. Um, they are a little shorter than the summative because, of course, they're not going to have any um, field test items or anything like that. This year, they are not available um, because we are updating obviously the test, they will be back next year. The biggest confusion is that um, some LEAs require benchmarks and some LEAs have required the interims. And the teachers were under the impression that it was the state requiring them. And so there was confusion about just what what really truly counts for them when it comes to state required assessments. The only thing that we require um, is the summative. And so we had a lot of teachers confused because they're like, well, we were told we have to do interims and we have to do benchmarks by our LEA. Um, so we thought that that was what was counting for us for accountability and everything. Um, so I think it really helps for you to make sure that your messaging is clear to your educators, um, what the purpose is for them having to give each test, if you do have any um, expectations or policies when it comes to giving benchmarks or interims, because of course, when they reach out to us um, or attend training, um, trainings with us, we're telling them they're optional. You don't have to give these per the state. Okay, um, now summative, it is required. Again, it's really reading language arts, that's for grades three through eight. And then it is only required for writing for grades five and eight. Again, there was confusion, okay, um, where some LEAs required all grades to do writing through the benchmarks. So, the only thing that we require at the state are grades five and eight for writing, the summative writing, okay? So again, this is just for language arts. This is not covering math or science, okay? This is just making sure that we all have a common understanding of the different assessment types available for RISE and what's required for the state. And maybe just some, some points of uh, thought for you when communicating what your LEA is going to require, okay? All right, so let's get in. Again, some of this will be repeat. Um, let's get into what's available this year because of all the changes. The benchmarks, again, optional. They are available, but they are just reading informational and reading literary benchmarks that are available right now. Those went live in September. The writing benchmarks, will be available come February. However, um, it's only if you volunteer to participate in the benchmark field test. It is not required, it is volunteer, okay? 
So for the benchmark field test, and, and we're not above begging, we need a lot of volunteers for that. So we have a slide dedicated to that. Um, interim, not available this year. Summative, that's obviously going to be available this year, and that's required. So again, for language arts, it's grades three through eight, and only writing grades five and eight. Those will be assessed this spring. Next, please. Um, just to, again, review the changes that took place, um, we have reading and writing for um, the benchmarks. Again, language, the editing ones were retired, speaking and listening were retired. We will have reading clusters as benchmarks available come February. Um, we do not have the exact date nailed down, but as soon as we do have that date, we will message it out. Um, and when you do finally see the writing benchmarks, if you are going to do the voluntary field test come February as well, you'll notice that the boilerplate language, that means the prompts, um, they have been updated. And then the rubrics also have been updated. We are in the process. Emails go in nonstop of really nailing down the rubric language. Um, I am going to say I'm going to be optimistic. I'm putting it out there in the universe that the rubrics are going to be available before December. So um, I'm really, really hoping we are in the process of actual copy editing, checking at this moment. So um, I think they're going to be available before December. Um, we will message that out as well. Now, the next slide the writing benchmark field test again optional it is for all grades again um, it's going to be a field test of new benchmark writing prompts um, for informative and argumentative the window will be open from february to march please do note though if you have educators participate in this voluntary field test there will not be automatic scoring because we need those student responses, those student essays to um, do a range finding and to help train our, our writing scoring engine, okay? Um, automatic scoring will resume next year on the benchmarks. That all being said, we need a lot of participants and volunteers. Um, we have to have thousands of papers per grade to make this happen in order to um, field test our benchmarks. And unfortunately, the, the reality of the situation is, is if we don't get enough papers, we don't have benchmarks then. <laughs> and we would have to do the field test again next year. So put your feelers out there, get as many people, message this out for us. We need participants. It's big and bold. The survey is open. We're gonna keep that survey open probably all through next month as well. Um, you know, beg if, if need be, um, or share this and be like, look at Megan on her knees begging. We really need volunteers, okay? Um, so the, the more we get, the more likely we'll be able to go back to our regular writing benchmarks next year. So, um, and then finally, our interim assessment on the next slide. Um, these will all be available next year. Really, truly, the changes that took place are the same that you will see on the summative. They're reading standards only. They will all include clusters. Um, there will be no editing and language items or speaking and listening items. These will be available again next year. Just make sure that everyone is aware that these are optional for the state. Okay. I'll turn it back over to Teresa. Okay, next slide. So our summative, um, there's the reading required for grades three through eight. Again, it really is just assessing reading. Every student will see at least one cluster. So please make sure that your teachers are using that training test and going through that cluster item with their students to make sure they understand how to use it, especially what we fondly call the choose your own adventure items where the students choose an item, um, say they choose a character from the story they read, and then they 
find the text evidence or answer a question about that character. They're, they don't get points for the character. There's not a correct answer. They get to choose whatever character they want. So that is a big difference that can really um, trip students up, especially your higher students who are like, there has to be a correct character. There isn't. It's any character they want. So um, please have your teachers use those training tests and then use those cluster benchmarks when they become available in February um, to help their students understand how the clusters work and also to just gain familiarity with that new item type and how they could also utilize that within their own instruction as well. Um, there is no automatic scoring this year for the summative. They will undergo a standard setting in the summer of 2025 and then you'll get scores in the fall. Next slide. And then writing is just required for grades five and eight for the summative. Um, we do have those changes with the boilerplate language for the prompts and those rubrics. Again, the writing um, benchmarks will have that boilerplate language. So even if you decide not to give the benchmarks, which we really hope you do because like Megan said, we need lots of student responses in order to train that scoring engine. But even if you choose um, not to give the benchmarks, please have your fifth and eighth grade teachers go in and look at them so they can see the changes to that prompt language and make sure that students are familiar with that prompt language and, and what it's asking them to do. The rubric should be I agree with Megan, hopefully available this month. And then the scoring will be a rubric based score. We don't have automatic scoring for writing because um, the writing summative assessments will undergo range finding this summer. And then scores will come out again in the fall, like the reading scores. And next slide. And the question was, is there a recording? Yes, it's available right there. I just put the recording um, on the slide so you can go to it it's on our USBE assessment YouTube page. And then we're also doing two additional trainings in January. So the one in January is gonna be around the writing updates. We're gonna specifically focus on the new writing prompt language and those rubrics. And go through the rubrics and talk about what it's asking students to do. Um, and then we will do another training around more reading updates focused on those assessment options and our reading blueprints and clusters and resources for helping students to improve their literacy um, and preparedness for the RISE assessment. So those two trainings are coming up in January. And I think that was it. Oh, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Now that's it. <laughs> and um, additionally, um, those January trainings, again, um, those will be recorded and posted as well. So if, if those times don't work, not to fear, um, those will be recorded. And I will add that um, we are going to be putting together um, just a short PowerPoint that has some audio with it. Um, if you are participating in those writing benchmarks, the process and the steps that you're going to take that you can share with your teachers who are going to be administering those writing benchmarks just to make sure that everybody understands the process and how to do it. Um, so we'll be putting that together um, in the next few weeks and that will, will come out for you to share with those who are participating. So please Please sign up for those writing benchmarks. I, I will I will do some begging as well. Yeah, team beg. Let's do it. Um, as far as the survey for writing benchmarks, um, that is an LEA choice. Um, in, in, and so we would just encourage good communication. Um, I, you know, highly encourage letting teachers know if you are signing them up for this, because um, they'll get an email from us and they'll be like, huh. 
not sure what this is. So um, I would just come up with a communication plan or how you want um, to sign people up for the opportunity. Um, as per um, supports for our multilingual learners on RISE and Utah Aspire Plus, um, there are lots of universal tools on both. And then, of course, we have the um, the adaptive translation for Spanish, if Spanish happens to be the student's first language for both assessments. Um, there are requirements. My suggestion is going to be to reach out to Elise and also reach out to Tracy or myself, um, and we can give you all the resources um, that we have to so you can learn about the different supports in place for our multilingual learners. Um, as far as Utah Aspire Plus, this one's going to be quick. Um, next slide. And next one. Again, um, what what's the same and what's changed? So for and we're again, we're only talking about the language arts subtests for Utah Aspire Plus. So English and reading. Okay. Um, so the biggest change is that the English subtest has been retired, again, due to the um, shift in the standards. As we know, most of the language standards were um, moved into primarily the writing standards. And so, um, as, as you know, we cannot assess writing outside of grades five and eight, so we weren't able to um, continue assessing those and conventions and grammar and everything without having a writing component. So the English subtest was was retired. But I mean, the good news here is that um, testing time is reduced by 45 minutes. Um, so that means that you will not get an English proficiency score on your reports this year. And you will not have an ELA composite skill score report as well, because there's nothing to um, you know, combine it with, so you'll just get the reading stuff, um, and you will not have a, an English-specific predicted ACT score. Um, what is the same? All the reporting for reading will still be the same. Composite scale score, proficiency score, ACT predicted score for reading, and there will still be an overall ACT composite score available, which is inclusive of English. We do have some one pagers that are going to be coming out. We're working with our communications department and pubs right now to get these um, finalized to explain the changes also for both RISE and Utah Spire Plus and also um, the predictive validity of um, Utah Spire Plus as well, given that we are um, dropping that English subtest. So more to come. Um, as, as we finalize those. And then another update. Um, this is exciting. Um, after we met with our TAC and APAC, um, we did determine that we do not have to do a full standard setting for our reading um, test because the change to the actual reading subtest was very, very minimal. Um, so those reading scores are not going to be delayed this year, um, which is great news. So um, we will just still encourage you all to make sure that students have the opportunity to practice um, with the platform and the item types by going to the um, practice tests on the Utah Spire Plus portal. And then you can see on the next slide the very, very slight changes to, um, to the reading blueprint. The, the biggest difference is the tiniest shift in percentage of it being a little heavier and informational. As we know in the upper grades, the language arts standards tend to be a little heavier in informational standards. So that is really the only change that um, students will maybe see um, if they even notice on the Utah Spire Plus test. Um, so questions. Looks like we got the link to the survey dropped in there. So only three tests for Utah Spire Plus, reading, math, and science. Yes, three subtests. Um, and then will teachers be able to see and review what the students write in the field test? 
that I'm going to turn over to Sid because I am actually not sure. Um, I don't think so. So they won't have scores yet. Um, so I don't think they will be, but actually that's something I think we'll need to follow up with our vendors to ensure. My assumption is no, um, just because they won't be seeing scores, but I know in the system, typically with benchmarks, you will be able to actually see the student's response. So we'll need to confirm um, with CAI whether that's the case or not. My assumption is no until we actually get the scoring um, worked out and we have teachers come in to do the range finding where they'll be re reviewing the student writing and then helping us to set where those cuts would be based off of the rubrics. Um, but that's something that we'll follow up with CAI to ensure it would be great if they could. I'm sure that will be helpful to get people to be more um, willing to participate in a benchmark if they can actually see their students' responses. Um, but we'll follow up on that for sure and then get back with you in our next 80 memo. Thanks. And I do believe that is it for me. So our friendly neighborhood ACT specialist is here. And everything ACT that you need to know, I've got it. Um, we'd like to thank everyone who's been emailing us to get themselves set up as a district test coordinator. Um, if you didn't fill out Maureen's survey, you need to email Maureen or myself, especially just email Maureen and copy me. Um, she's been out of the office this week, but I've been filling in and getting everyone hooked up. And so I'm going to want to make sure you get hooked up to ACT now so you can upload your users and get your schools all set up for testing on that. There's a training today. Don't forget our online readiness webinar is on our Zoom that um, Emily will be running for us. It will be recorded. All of our recordings, we all of our meetings we try to record so that you can have access to them because we know Everyone wants your time, your schedule gets used up, and it's just will drive you bonkers. Um, December 12th is the next one, and these are the links that will work for those uh, for the upcoming trainings. And then January 16th, we have our pre-test date activities in December, and then our test day administration webinar in January. And um, those are the links for them. They're also loaded on our schedule events. So if you lose this PowerPoint, it's on the ACT Utah schedule events also. Next slide. Um, yeah, there it is, schedule events. There's a link for it. <laughs> it's your up-to-date thing of where everything that needs to happen. It's got all the links for it. It has all the little test, technical manuals, test administration manuals, all the hoops you need to jump through to make sure everything works. So next slide. Um, fee waivers. Last year, we, um, we started really you know, beating the bandwagon for getting fee waivers out there. These are waivers that go out for students, usually seniors, who qualify for this waiver because of some type of financial need in the home. And it could be they're on free reduced lunch. They um, they could be, um, you know, had, had a, a, a loss of a job in the family. We don't ask questions. ACT normally doesn't ask questions unless all of a sudden you know, 1,000 fee waivers are given out at a high school and all of in, the, in your senior class is 1,100 kids. That starts to beg some questions. But um, last year we had a big increase in the number of fee waivers that were ordered, which we really love and we want to see to go even higher. Um, more students registered last year and 44.6% more students actually took that fee waiver and tested. And so um, to the question in the chat, if you haven't received an email from ACT now, and you try logging into the system first and see if you have access to 2025. But if you know you didn't answer Marine's survey last month, then you probably need to drop us an email and we'll get you hooked up. Just let me know who you want to be your district test coordinator. And it can be more than one person, Greg. So happy to do that for you. Next slide. Um, some things about these waivers that sometimes people forget, we want to make sure everyone knows about this, is it's not just, hey, take the test again. There's on-demand tutorials that the students get. There's video lessons. There's access to over 2,000 retired, re retired ACT questions with the answers. They can take five practice tests for free. They can track their progress with a built-in syllabus. They have a full year of access to all this before they do the retake. And then that free test also allows them to receive the test copy with answers and they get a free report to the high school and up to six more colleges um, and on top of once they might have decided to change versus their junior year taking the test. 
And in some cases, if they follow the ACT guidelines, their college application fees can be waived. And so those are getting to be pretty expensive nowadays, and that could be a, a significant chunk of money, especially if they're applying to a lot of universities. Is this available only to seniors? No, it's not, Cassidy, but we um, usually want it after students have taken their tests in their junior, in the spring of the junior year. And so after, if, if you have a junior that comes back and says, I just took the test, I want to do a retake, you can go ahead and give it to them also. But let's have them take first their junior, their free one here, and we'll see, give them a benchmark level and see, okay, this is where we're at, and, um, and then go from there. Next slide. I'm out of the office in December. The C is definitely calling me. And so I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef and in Fiji. And um, sorry if you can't be there because it's going to be a great time. Um, but if you have questions about ACT now, please contact Maureen. Anything about ACT accommodations, you know Jessica is your contact there. And anything that pops up about secondary science adjustment, please contact Jared. He does elementary, but we trust him. He knows what he's talking about. And so we'll get Jared to, to fill in with any questions on, on secondary science. And if you can wait till um, December 30th, 31st, I'll be back December 31st, promise. I'll be here online cleaning up a whole bunch of messy emails, I'm sure. Um, and if you can wait to that point, just go ahead and drop me an email, and I'll get to that at the end of this year. And that should be it, I think. I think the only thing we got left is if there's any more questions. And if, not, if you do, email me. Pop them in the chat. And this is going to be, I think, one of our fastest AD meetings on record. We're really flying through these. I think awesome. there's one more slide. I added in a slide. Okay, so um, yeah, that's, there's that's some, not me, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the last slide, so you're almost done. This is a record, I think, for us. Um, there's some clarification I wanted to make. This is going to affect a very small portion of our students. But just in case anybody in your LEA comes to you, if you have um, – for sure, direct them to me, and I can, I can send a clarification, but I just want to kind of put this bug in your ear. Last year, um, ACT changed um, the delivery of how students um, engage in their ACT assessment if they require ASL. There is, an for their online platform, which, you know, all of our students are going to be doing an online format unless they have an accommodation for paper this year, the ASL that the students require for test content is embedded into the ACT online test. If the student has an accommodation for paper, there will be a secure delivery um, of the URL, which will have the video ASL for the student to access. And the main reason for this change was just to increase the um, standardization of the test to maximize the students receiving the test information in the same way. Um, and so that is just for ASL. And the great thing about this accommodation is that you can test students in groups. So if you have a couple of students that are going to utilize this accommodation in your LEA, um, you can coordinate testing them um, in one room. If the students are going to use cued speech or signed exact English, that is different. That will be with an interpreter, and those um, personnel will need to sign an ACT interpreter agreement and abide by the guidance that's posted. Um, the one thing that ACT really wanted to stress about this accommodation is to really ensure um, you are working with your technology staff to ensure that you've gone through the tech specs um, required for ACT because you really have to have the appropriate bandwidth, bandwidth in order for the video to stream um, without interruptions. So just a little uh, tidbit of information. I know that won't impact too many students, but if you do get any questions around this in your LEA, just feel free to direct them to myself or call the ACT accommodations hotline, and we're happy to go through more details with them. All right. Well, thank you all. I appreciate um, you joining us today and getting your questions answered. We will get back to you with um, the question about the writing benchmarks. Um, watch for that in the coming AD memos when we get a response from Cambium. And in the meantime, if you have other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to um, engage with you at any point. So let us know if you have questions. Thank you all. Yeah, that was a nice quick meeting. <laughs> we'll see you all again in December. You say there's a question in the chat. Um, oh, 
the grad rates is the grad rates data embargoed. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think so. Um, I haven't seen anything that came out, but I know that, that, that typically with the accountability information, it does get embargoed for a little bit. We'll follow up with Brittany and with our accountability team and then respond back um, ASAP if the grad rates are embargoed. So if you don't hear back from us shortly, then they will we'll plan on them not being embargoed um, and we'll reach out if they are embargoed. And then there's also a question that says, UA plus math test practice links are all showing up as Spanish, even the ones that don't say Spanish. But if you click mm -hmm. on them and open them, they won't be in Spanish. <laughs> You're good. So we can talk with um, with Pearson about making sure that the title is correct on there. So that's not confusing. But thanks for bringing that up. I don't see any other questions. We'll hang out for just a minute just to make sure. But thank you all again for joining us. I'm on the UA plus practice test right now. The just regular math, not, or the English version of math for grades nine and 10, and it's showing up as English for me. So I don't know if there's something going on on the other end. When in doubt, clear your cash. Um, well, what it will say, um, Katie, if you look at the top, it says question sampler math muestra de preguntas matemáticas. But that's the only part that appears in Spanish. That's the only part. Yeah. I was going to say, the, <laughs> if, the items are in English. But, the items yeah. will appear <laughs> in English. Like the title appears in both English and Spanish. But that's a little odd. Continue well, through. To Pearson then. <laughs> yeah. So continue through. You're good. It will appear in English. <laughs> that's bizarre. <laughs> Elise, that says the Utah Rise TAM does not have the updated participation codes. I can double check. That might be a cash clear one too, because I know that I've approved it to go through, but I'll double check. Cassidy, the Utah Spire Plus TAM doesn't get updated and posted until just like when we update the Adam stuff. So expect that January, February. And Christine, I'm looking at it and it's not in there. So I'm wondering if it just hasn't been posted to the portal yet, but I can work with CAI to get that updated and posted. And Elise, just for your reference in case, I don't know if you already looked at this or not, but the screen reader and non-screen reader are both doing the same thing with Spanish at the top. I have brought that to their attention and it just that's just how it's labeled. It's not going to go away. So, and is that only that's not only for math, at least that's not the ELA one. Well, it is. I once upon a time it was all of them. Yeah, that's because the question was, was I didn't think that them. the English test would appear in Spanish, and I was like, the English test doesn't. It's just the title. Promise. <laughs> right. Huh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's all of them, like every every test for every content. I just clicked on English again. Mm. I think um, English can come down finally now after this week, correct? Yes, yeah, it can after this week. All right, I'm not hearing any other questions, so I think we can exit the meeting. Thank you, Emily, for getting this recording done, and thanks, team, for presenting. That was a nice, quick meeting. Have a good day.